Okay, well, we're kicking off this morning with um, a fabulous talk uh, that you're going to hear from Dr. Rick Kalp. Um, Dr. Kalp has been at the National Vaccine Research Center at the NIAID at NIH for the last 22 or so years. So he's been integrally involved with the development of uh, HIV vaccines and also was involved incidentally, <laughs> not really incidentally, with COVID vaccine, quite integrally with COVID vaccine development. But one of the questions that our patients ask a lot or what you hear about at cocktail parties is, where's the HIV vaccine? We could do this with COVID. Why is it taking so long? And so Dr. Kalp's going to talk to us about that uh, today, talk about what's happening now with the development of new vaccines, how that spun off uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies that can also now be used for therapeutics and are being worked up that way. So for this overview and, and uh, a lot of excuses for why this hasn't happened so far, here's Dr. Kalp. So thank you, Mike. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to you about HIV vaccines and monoclonal antibodies, which are two things that you're probably not going to use at all in your clinical practice. So um, I, I hope he explained why I was invited to give this talk, and I hope you'll find it interesting. So I have no uh, relevant financial relationships uh, to report. Uh, the learning objective. So hopefully, uh, after attending this presentation, you'll be able to describe the current status of HIV vaccines, uh, list several epitopes targeted by HIV monoclonal antibodies, and describe potential clinical uses of HIV monoclonal antibodies. I'm going to cover a few things in my talk. I'll start with a brief history of HIV vaccine development and the, the lessons that we've learned and then talk about the current vaccine strategies that we're testing right now, talk about the importance of structure-based vaccine design, talk about germline targeting immunogens to induce neutralizing antibodies, and then talk about a, a sort of strange new concept of CMV vectors to induce uh, these HLAE-restricted CD8 T cell responses. And then I'll move on and talk about monoclonal antibodies for prevention, treatment, and cure. So yeah, the uh, history of HIV vaccine development has been a long and difficult one. It's been 40 years. We still have about uh, 40 million individuals living with HIV uh, at any day. And so despite this 40 years of, of work, uh, we really don't have a vaccine. You'll re many of you, the, the older in the room, will remember Margaret Heckler, the day that uh, the vaccine or the uh, HIV was discovered uh, in Bob Gallo's group and in the, the uh, Luc Montagnier's group, she made the statement uh, that we would have a vaccine for testing in two years. People often misquote her as saying we'll have a vaccine in two years. And obviously, uh, we didn't have a vaccine in two years. We didn't have a vaccine for testing in two years, but we did have one in four years. So the first Phase one safety testing of vaccines began in 1987, four years uh, after, uh, after the announcement of, of the discovery of HIV. It wasn't until 2003 that we started doing actual efficacy testing of vaccines, and we've been doing that for 20 years now, and as you know, we don't have a vaccine yet, despite all the multiple trials that I show on this slide. So it's important to put this in context. We all lived through the SARS uh, epidemic. We all saw how rapidly the vaccine was developed. In less than a year, we had emergency use authorization uh, after the discovery of, of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, in under two years, we had licensed vaccines. So why was it so quick to develop vaccines against SARS-CoV-2, and why is it taking so long for HIV? Well, people like to think, well, it's mRNA. mRNA is really quick, and now that we have mRNA, we'll be able to develop HIV vaccines very quickly. And in fact, 
The big problem is that SARS-CoV-2 and HIV are inherently different viruses with vastly different susceptibilities to pre-existing and vaccine-induced immunity. Vaccines against SARS-CoV-2, as you know, don't provide sterilizing immunity for the most part. What they do is uh, moderate the disease course once individuals get infected. So I think probably many of you in the room, if not all of you, have been vaccinated against SARS-CoV-2 and you probably got infected. And what you got was a cold, maybe a bad cold, but you weren't in the hospital, you weren't on a respirator, hopefully. And that's what the vaccine does. HIV is different. HIV is a lentivirus. It incorporates into the host genome and is virtually never cleared except for those uh, handful of cases where bone marrow transplant was required to clear the virus. So vaccines against HIV will almost certainly have to provide sterilizing immunity. In addition, HIV uses an error-prone reverse transcriptase which lacks a proofreading uh, function. And what this means is that HIV continues to adapt. So all the time that an individual is infected, the immune response is basically driving changes within the virus. So the quasi-species of HIV is huge, and it's going to make it very difficult to cover that huge uh, quasi-species with a vaccine. All right. So for 20 years, we've been doing HIV vaccine trials. What have we learned? The very first vaccines uh, for HIV were against monomeric GP120. What we found is that they induced antibodies against GP120 that bound but didn't neutralize. So we learned that antibodies that bind to HIV envelope but don't neutralize don't protect. Around this time, there was a lot of data coming out from long-term non-progressors saying that CD8 T cells could suppress virus. So Merck came up with the idea, okay, let's develop a vaccine that just makes classical CD8 T cells against the virus. And maybe people will get infected, but they'll be suppressed and they'll have very low viral loads. They won't transmit. So let's give that a try. They did a couple of trials, ad 5 based uh, trials. None of them worked. Uh, so Classical CD8 T cells uh, in the absence of neutralizing antibodies do not protect. Then we had what we call the Thai trial. This was an ADV ALVAC, which is a, vaccine, a modified vaccinia virus followed by GP120 boosting, and there was 31% efficacy. And the correlates immune analysis in that study indicated that it wasn't neutralizing antibodies, but maybe non-neutralizing antibodies uh, that correlated with the, this 31% protection, possibly through ADCC, or antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So this was very exciting. However, a follow-up study was done that was very similar. The only difference was a different GP120 was used, a different adjuvant, and it was in a much higher risk population no protection in that trial, so that 31% efficacy was probably spurious. And then a series of other ad-based vaccines induced, that induced both CD8 T cells and non-neutralizing antibodies didn't protect. So that's the history to date, and what we've learned is that HIV vaccines so far have failed to induce neutralizing antibodies and failed to protect. So, our current feeling is that we should really be putting our efforts into inducing neutralizing antibodies, but that's going to be difficult. And it's going to be difficult because the envelope rapidly evolves, it's heavily glycosylated, and there are multiple clades of HIV and very limited cross-protection between them. So let me tell you what we're doing now, and I'll start with talking about structure-based vaccine design. So when I talk about structure-based vaccine design, what I'm talking about is using atomic level structure of viral surface proteins to develop vaccines. So RSV, SARS-CoV-2, and HIV all have envelope-like proteins which are trimeric, and they're called type 1 fusion proteins. And these proteins mediate viral entry. And they may not look uh, very, very similar, here in their crystal structure, but 
the, gen the genetic structure of those uh, envelope glycoproteins is very similar. They have a surface protein which, which binds to the receptor. You then have a transmembrane uh, protein that has a fusion peptide, a transmembrane domain, and a couple of heptad repeats that allow uh, the, the uh, viral envelope to then fuse uh, with the membrane uh, of uh, the cell that it's entering. Now, you, you're well aware of the fact that RSV and SARS-CoV-2, we've recently developed vaccines against them. And what was critical for their development was atomic level structure that allowed the design of a stabilized trimeric prefusion form of these fusion proteins. So, what then about uh, HIV GP160? Well, the interesting thing is all those vaccine trials that I told you about where we saw no efficacy, not one of them used an HIV envelope in a stabilized trimeric prefusion form. But not to worry, we're, we're on the case and we're now starting to develop these types of uh, proteins for HIV. And this started back in uh, 2015 when Rohir Saunders and uh, uh, John Moore uh, from Cornell University and the Academic Medical Center in, in the Netherlands uh, learned how to make these stabilized trimeric forms of the HIV uh, glycoprotein. And what they did is they, they put a, a number of disulfide bonds in, a tri trimerization domain at the bottom, and what they saw is that the more uh, disulfide bonds uh, they put in, uh, the better the stability was and the better the immune response was. And then in a uh, very nice study in rabbits, they showed that if they had this very nicely formed, stabilized trimeric form of the, of the envelope, immunized rabbits, they got neutralizing antibodies. If their trimers weren't well structured and looked like this, they didn't get neutralizing antibodies. So these things, uh, these stabilized prefusion forms of the envelope uh, in a trimeric form are going to be important, but they only neutralize against uh, the virus uh, that was part of the vaccine. So they don't give heterologous or broad neutralization. So we're going to need more. The other thing about the atomic structure, what it's allowed us to do is identify sites on the virus, envelope like a protein, that are uh, targets of broadly neutralizing antibodies. So we now know of at least seven sites on the HIV envelope uh, that are targeted by broadly neutralizing antibodies, indicating that really these should be where we're targeting our vaccines. And so now all we have to do with this knowledge is develop immunogens that will stimulate responses to these different sites. And that's what we're doing a lot of. The CD4 binding site is one of the, the top uh, regions that we're uh, looking at, uh, and the reason for that are several. One, CD4 binding site uh, antibodies all form a single class. They have very similar sequences of the immunoglobulin gene, so that you can just uh, take an immunoglobulin, sequence it, and you pretty much know if it's a CD4 binding site antibody. Uh, in addition, uh, if you uh, uh, look at uh, how these antibodies are developed in individuals who are HIV infected, we know how this occurs. What happens uh, is there's a B cell precursor with an immunoglobulin. Uh, the HIV envelope uh, from a, an individual starts to stimulate that. It produces this antibody. That antibody binds to the, the envelope starts to neutralize that virus. The virus doesn't like that, so it changes its envelope. Changes the envelope, the antibody then matures, changes to attack the new envelope, which then has to change, et cetera, et cetera. And over this uh, time, timely process, you get to really broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. But this is what we have to try and recapitulate through vaccination. So that brings me to the topic of germline targeting immunogens to induce neutralizing antibodies. So as I say, what we're trying to do is recapitulate this with CD4, uh, to induce CD4 binding site antibodies, VRCO1 uh, class broadly neutralizing antibodies, 
Uh, and one of the people who is furthest along in this is Bill Sheaf uh, from uh, Scripps. And uh, what he did uh, is he looked at the HIV envelope, he looked at the CD4 binding site, and he developed an immunogen that looked like this part of the envelope uh, where CD4 binding site antibodies bind. He called this EODGT8, engineered outer domain GT8 for the glycosylations that he put on there. Uh, and he uh, did preclinical studies in animals and showed that sure enough, this was a good immunogen to stimulate this initial naive B cell precursor to start to expand and respond to this vaccine. He then took that EODGT8 and put it on a, a molecule called lumazine synthase, which has 60 binding sites. So you now had 60 of these EODGT8s decorating a nanoparticle. Uh, they did a clinical trial where they vaccinated people, and then what they did is they pulled the B cells out of those individuals after vaccination. They did flow cytometry and identified the B cells uh, that were actually binding to that EODGT8 antigen, did the sequencing, and as I told you, all CD4, uh, all VRCO1 class antibodies have a certain sequence, so they could look at those sequences and say, I think these are, are the types of antibodies we wanted to, to stimulate. But they could also then produce them and actually do binding studies. And when they, when they did that, this was a trial with a placebo, a low dose and a high dose. They saw that the low dose and high dose individuals, basically all of them responded by making B cells, which were VRCO1 class. In addition, uh, if they looked at the number of memory B cells that were expanding, there was a dose response and they, the higher dose gave them more of these B cells. So this was published recently in Science uh, and indicates that this type of, uh, of, of strategy is working. So they've been able to do this, but we need to do this. We now need other immunogens to push these antibodies along the pathway that's seen in people who are infected, and that's gonna take a while, but it's ongoing. I also wanna indicate that, that Bill Sheaf maybe furthest along here, but the, he's not the only group doing this. So Rohir Saunders, who uh, developed the SOSIP uh, uh, proteins, he uh, has a similar uh, uh, vaccine strategy he's working on. Uh, Leo Stamatatos uh, also. Uh, uh, Peter Kwong is working on one, targeting the fusion peptide. Uh, and Bart Haynes has uh, similar processes targeting multiple other sites on the virus. So I think the, the germline stimulating uh, uh, strategy is, is a strong one, but I wanna, I'm, I'm in Portland, Oregon, and so I have to talk about a, a local story. Uh, and that is CMV vectors to induce HLA -A E restricted CD8 T cells. So, Lewis Picker and Klaus Fru from uh, the uh, Oregon Health Sciences University here in Portland have been working for 20 to 25 years uh, on CMV vectors for HIV vaccines. What they did is they made a rhesus CMV vector that expressed almost all of the SIV, the simian immunodefic immunodeficiency version uh, of HIV. And they vaccinated monkeys and then challenged those monkeys. And what you see happened is uh, shown over here. All the monkeys got infected, even these down here, they got a little blip of virus. But then about 55% of them cleared the virus and 45% of them did not. And those that did not clear the virus, it looks like they got no vaccine whatsoever. Here, here's the empty CMV vector or the uninfected or the uh, you know, unvaccinated controls. No difference between these monkeys. But if you got protection, you basically cleared the virus and did extremely well. None of these monkeys made any antibodies. About 55% uh, of the protected monkeys went on to clear SIV infection. The other 45% showed no vaccine effect, and what they were able to show is this virus control was mediated by CD8 T cells. Now, show of hands, who remembers about CD8 uh, T cell 
uh, recognition and MHC restriction. That's what I thought, okay. So a quick primer. So CD8 T cells were taught uh, recognize viral peptides in the class of MHC1, or HLA A, B, and C in humans. CD4 cells recognize viral peptides in the context of MHC2, or HLA-D, and NK cells recognize these viral peptides in the context of uh, MHC-E, or HLA-E in humans. In a long series, about 10 years of work, what uh, Klaus Fru and, and uh, Louis Picker were able to show was this 55% protection they were seeing was mediated by CD8 T cells, but it wasn't CD8 T cells that recognized peptides in the context of A, B, or C, or D. It was HLA-E restricted CD8 T cells. And so what they have now done, Veer Biotech has, has uh, licensed this technology. They've made equivalent human CMV vectors. A phase one clinical trial has been done. This uh, expresses just HIV gag, so it's just a, a proof of concept. And the question is, did, these, uh, did this vaccine generate HLA restrict, HLA-E restricted CD8 T cells? The, the trial just finished. Those results should be coming out soon, and we certainly hope uh, that it was uh, a, a positive response. Okay, in the last 10 minutes, let me tell you about the current status of HIV monoclonal antibodies for prevention, treatment, and cure. So, Broadly neutralizing anti monoclonal antibodies can be used for several different things. They can be used for prevention, uh, to prevent acquisition of infection in high-risk individuals, including infants, uh, uh, including breastfed infants. And there, what you're trying to do is block transmission. And it's unknown at this point whether you have to deal with the entire quasi-species of virus that's coming, uh, that's being presented at the mucosal surface, or if you only have to deal with the few viruses that get across that mucosal uh, surface. In terms of treatment, there's, uh, treatment and cure, there's two main areas that are being looked at. One, maintaining viral suppression induced by antiretroviral therapy. And in this case, what we're asking the, the monoclonal antibodies to do is really block entry uh, of the virus into cells. And so, these can be thought of as long-acting, injectable, entry inhibitor antiretrovirals. The other thing that uh, we're looking at uh, is for cure. So the monoclonal antibody will bind to the virus or virus that's budding from cells uh, on one end of uh, the antibody. The other end of the antibody is called the FC region. That can bind to effector cells such as NK cells. Those can then kill these infected cells. And so it's possible that even if you, if you don't have envelope expressed on the latent reservoir cell, as soon as that latent reservoir starts to reactivate, hopefully through this, uh, this interaction of the broadly neutralizing antibody and NK cells, you'll be able to kill that cell before it produces virus. So this is how it's mostly these uh, antibodies are mostly being used in a cure strategy. In terms of prevention, we already know that uh, CD4 binding site broadly neutralizing antibodies will protect against HIV acquisition. This, this was uh, a trial, two randomized clinical trials, the AMP trials, uh, where BRCO1 was given to thousands of individuals who were at high risk of acquiring HIV infection. And what was seen is in this top curve that against viruses that were sensitive uh, to the level of, uh, vir of antibody that was given, you got sustained 75% efficacy uh, against infection. Obviously, viruses that were somewhat resistant, you didn't get protection, it just means you had to give more of the antibody. In terms of treatment, as I mentioned, the main thing that, we're, we're, uh, that individuals are looking at is can we maintain suppression? So in individuals who are on antiretroviral therapy and are suppressed, can you stop that antiretroviral therapy 
and then instead give monthly, every other month, uh, anti, uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies and maintain su suppression. There are lots of studies that have been done along this lines. Here's one from Taewok Chun, where he used two antibodies, 3BNC117 and 101074. And what you can see is over the six months that the antibodies were given, no one had to go back on antiretroviral therapy, whereas the placebos, everybody had to go back on antiretroviral therapy. And then once they stopped the broadly neutralizing antibodies, the levels of those antibodies went down and the virus came back up. Now, they didn't all fully suppress. You know, some individuals did have low-level viremia, uh, but they were all uh, able to be maintained uh, off of antiretrovirals. So we have lots of broadly neutralizing antibodies, uh, way too many uh, than I can describe today, uh, and they target multiple different uh, sites uh, on uh, the envelope glycoprotein. They're different from antiretroviral uh, their, uh, uh, drugs in that their, uh, their resistance profiles can be somewhat complicated. So here I show you three different antibodies, a CD4 binding site antibody, uh, a V3 antibody, and a V1, V2 antibody. And what I'm showing you here is uh, their, their se sensitivity against 208 viruses down this side. If you see orange or yellow, it means that they're sensitive. If it's blue, they're resistant. So you see CD4 binding site antibody, you catch most of the viruses. For these other two, you don't catch everything. And in fact, there, there's complementarity uh, between the, CD, uh, the V3 and the uh, V1, V2 antibodies. Uh, so that uh, you can sometimes get triple coverage, sometimes double coverage, and sometimes single coverage. As we know, just like with antiretroviral therapy, if you have only single coverage, you're probably going to get resistance. And all the data suggests that you will. The other nice thing about mono, uh, broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, they have a long half-life, usually about 15 days. But you can make simple mutations in the FC region, and you can get much longer half-lives, now up to 71, in some cases, 90 days. So you can give very infrequent dosing. So what are the basic principles here? Well, these have a long half-life, and so you just need to maintain the, the uh, broadly neutralizing antibody above the therapeutic threshold with infrequent dosing. Uh, the potency and breadth are obviously important and differ from antibody to antibody. You should look for a high barrier to resistance. Uh, use of single BNABs will lead certainly to resistance and combination therapy will be required. Last three or so slides, I just want to talk about what's actually out there in development. So GSK and Vive are working on a monoclonal antibody called N6LS. This was developed by the Vaccine Research Center. Uh, they have been testing uh, about giving this antibody with uh, what's basically Hyaluronidase. So you usually have to give these uh, antibodies intravenously. You can give them subcutaneously, but you can't give big volumes. If you give hyaluronidase, you open up that subcutaneous tissue, and then you can give large volumes. They have a study called the Banner Study where they, they looked at the antiviral activity. And then they have uh, the EMBRACE trial, which is a study to investigate viral suppression uh, using uh, both uh, the monoclonal antibody and a long-acting antiretroviral cabotegravir. Just to show you the antiviral activity, this is from the Banner trial. Uh, 13 of 14 participants uh, showed a response, uh, and that was uh, a one and a half to two and a half log decrease in virus. And as I said, the antibody has a half-life of about 15 days, and after 15 days, the antibody goes down and the virus comes back up. Gilead also has two antibodies that I told you about earlier, 3BNC117 and 101074, that they have named these things that I can't pronounce. Um, and they have shown in several studies uh, that they're safe and they have good PK. 
they have a uh, study, much like the one I just told you about from Vive, where they're using these two antibodies in combination with the long-acting antiretroviral lenacaprevir to see if they can maintain suppression. And they're also using it in a, uh, a cure strategy with a TLR9 agonist uh, to, uh, that will work as a latency reduce, uh, reversing agent. The last uh, antibody I'm going to tell you about uh, is something produced by TIMED. And they do actually have a licensed product, Ibilizumab, which uh, is an anti-CD4 antibody. So it binds to CD4 on cells and blocks HIV from using that uh, CD4 to enter uh, the cell. And that's approved for combination antiretroviral therapy. What's new is they've combined that uh, into a bispecific antibody. So here's the belizumab arm. And this arm is 10E8, which is a membrane proximal external region uh, antibody. And they're testing uh, this uh, combination uh, multispecific antibody in HIV uh, uninfected and infected adults and in combination with another CD4 binding site antibody, BRCO7523LS. So what have I told you today? Well, hopefully I've told you that after 20 years of disappointment, Recent achievements have provided hope for the ultimate goal of developing a protective vaccine against HIV. We have the proof of concept that broadly neutralizing antibodies protect against HIV acquisition. We've got the ability to stabilize the envelope tri trimer in a native prefusion form. We've developed immunogens that can stimulate and expand naive B cell precursors. And we've got the discovery that a vaccine-induced HLA-E-restricted CD8 T cells can clear SIV infection. And in terms of monoclonal antibodies, HIV B NABs have the potential for HIV prevention, therapy, and cure. They function as long-acting injectable entry inhibitors, consistent with the basic principles of antiretroviral anti therapy. Single B NAB therapy invariably leads to resistance. BNABs will need to be used in combination with other BNABs or antiretrovirals, and several BNABs are in clinical development, mostly for maintenance of viral suppression in combination with long-acting antiretrovirals. I just want to say that uh, I had a lot of help putting this together, and I thank everyone who was involved, and I'm happy uh, to take any questions you may have. Thank you. That was fantastic, Rick. Um, let me start off with a, a question about the CMV um, uh, CD8 cells because we're important. Um, it seems to me that for two quick questions. One is that 45% that don't respond, is that related to them having had CMV infection or, is, I mean, what's the nature of why don't they respond? Yeah, that's a very good question, and that's actually been looked at. <clears throat> so most of the monkeys that were used uh, were CMV positive, but they've looked at CMV negative and CMV uh, positive uh, monkeys, no difference. Uh, I used to tease uh, Lewis Picker about this because I would say, how can you tell, okay, you, all of your monkeys have responded, but only 55% are protected. Can you look at that HLA E restricted response and tell me which monkeys are going to be protected and which are not? Uh, and the answer was no. But uh, working with Michael Gale uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle, they did uh, transcriptomic analysis and found that there were certain transcriptomic signatures that identified the, the monkeys that were going to be protected. Mm -hmm. And that was an IL-15 response. Uh, so, so there is something. You have to have that HLA-E restricted response, but you also have to have the IL-15 uh, signature to get protection. Okay. I'll, I'll, let's take the question in the microphone. Uh, Adam Link, Lancaster. Um, what are steps that are be being taken now in these early phases to ensure equitable access to this if and when something comes to market, the vast majority of our patients are already marginalized, and that's within the U.S., mm -hmm. let alone in resource-limited areas. 
So are there steps being taken right now to ensure that there's gonna be equitable access if and when something becomes available? Yeah, so that's a, an obviously very important question and something we learned a lot about in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, vaccine trials is that we had to very early on make sure that A, it was tested in the right populations and that B, we had a plan to actually make it, make it available. Uh, so uh, most of the, the work is being done within the HVTN trials network, the HVTN. Uh, they are obviously well aware of these issues and they're working hard. A lot of the, the vaccine clinical trials are being done in resource limited uh, settings. Uh, so uh, I'm not gonna say that uh, for the vaccines that, uh, that uh, everything will go swimmingly, but it's, it's front and center on a lot of people's mind. And that's also true, certainly, for, for the uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. Okay, we have a number of questions on cards here. Where's one? Uh, Ibilizumab, um, can it interfere with the MHC2 and recognition in CD4 function? Wow, we have an immunologist in the, in the uh, <laughs> audience. Very good. Um, so yes, that was a concern for ibilizumab in that it binds CD4, and CD4 is critical for recognition through MHC class two. Turns out uh, that the region of uh, CD4 that the antibody binds to is separate from the uh, region uh, that is involved in MHC class two restricted recognition. And so, yeah, that was all worked out, and no, it does not affect uh, the generation of class two restricted responses. Right, and it seems important to reemphasize that the, ant the BNABs that are anti-CD4 domain targeted are going against the virus, virus not the CD4 not receptor. The yeah. yeah, and ibilizumab, because it binds, you know, I told you that these antibodies have a nice long half-life. Because ibilizumab binds to CD4 cells, not the virus, it actually has a very short half-life, only, only about a day or two. So you, that, has to, that, uh, that monoclonal has to be dosed much more frequently. Okay. Um, how about side effects from BNAB infusion therapy? Yeah, so it, it's interesting. In general, you know, obviously there are uh, an, lot of uh, monoclonal antibodies out there that have been used for lots of other things. The HIV monoclonal antibodies, in general, most of them have not had side effects. A few of them uh, have, and we're, we're trying to figure out what, what, uh, what the issues are with some. 10 e uh, one of the uh, antibodies that we developed at the VRC, you know, gave these huge site reactions when, uh, in injection site reactions when given subcutaneously and had very short half-life. Uh, there are other monoclonal antibodies that are, are showing a, a few systemic uh, effects. So, yeah, we, we try and sort those things out uh, very early in the clinical development and when we see side effects, we try and figure out what's causing it and see if we can engineer that out of the monoclonal antibody. Um, this is a practical question. If you have someone who's on successful antiretroviral therapy doing well, is there any benefit to switching to BNAB therapy? Well, at, at the present time, you really can't switch to, to BNAB therapy. Our hope is uh, that if you have someone who's doing very well on uh, antiretroviral therapy, and then we have as an option uh, either BNABs or long-acting antiretrovirals, uh, you'll have choices and your patients will have choices. Uh, and that's basically what we're, we're trying to get to. Uh, do you, do you want to be on long anti antiretrovirals? Do you want to be on BNABs? Do they all work similarly? The more choices, uh, the better off both you and your patients will be, I think. Okay, um, there's one, it feels like it's a really good question, but I, I'm having trouble reading all of it, but I think it's getting to the issue of people that have uh, established HIV infection for a long time before they start therapy. They have CD4 cells and reservoirs that are established. They get started on therapy, et cetera. Can any of these approaches be used, in essence, to a target the reservoir cells. I, I'm thinking maybe these uh, CD8 special cells or start to encroach upon the area of cure research. Yeah, so, so absolutely. I mean, CD8 T cells are one of the things uh, that 
people have been trying to use in cure uh, strategies, trying to vaccinate to get stronger CD8 T cells, knowing that you know, we'll be able to attack those HIV uh, infected cells. Uh, turns out these HLA-E restricted CD8 T cells, when, when Lewis Picker did studies to see if they, they worked on the reservoir, they didn't, unfortunately, and mm -hmm. we don't know why that is. The BNABs, as I mentioned, uh, through their interaction with NK cells uh, may also be a, a good strategy for, for attacking the reservoir, and so yes. And, and obviously, the, the smaller the reservoir, so the earlier people go on antiretroviral therapy after uh, getting infected, the smaller the reservoir will be, the, the better or the greater the likelihood that any of these strategies will work. So that may have been something that Yeah, so this segues, your answer just segues nicely into something uh, that, that I think a lot of folks are wondering, and that is uh, it's easy to conceptualize a BNAB sort of being a sponge that soaks up virus that gets produced, and that could be its sole mechanism of action. But are there other interactions with the immune system like NK cells that may be responsible for some of the effect? Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, I think that uh, neutralization is sort of their, their primary uh, uh, action. There were a couple of uh, papers uh, a year or two ago, one from my group, one from David Ho's group, where we looked at uh, in, in active viral replication, what percentage of the antiviral activity uh, was related to neutralization and what percent may be related to something like ADCC. And what we found is that the majority of the activity was neutralization, but ADCC or some FC-related function may be anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of the activity of these monoclonal antibodies. Yeah. Uh, this is straightforward. Uh, do the BNABs require IV infusion? Can they be given sub or other ways? Yeah, so uh, they most certainly can be given sub-Q. Uh, you can only get to about five milligrams per kilogram subcutaneously, and depending upon the size of the person, you s then may still need to give two or three injection sites. And so that's why we've been looking at hyaluronidase. Uh, then you can actually give much larger volumes uh, subcutaneously. I'll try to do justice. I'm not sure I fully understand, but the question is, are all of the new therapies, like I guess BNAVs, dependent on a presumed domain of, of the virus being sort of constant? I guess in that trimer uh, that you're describing. Well, uh, so um, I don't know uh, quite what's being asked. It could be the, the location within the body. Right. Um, so if, if that's what's being asked, certainly, We've been doing tracking studies of the broadly neutralizing antibodies to see, do they get to the mucosa? Do they get into the lymph node? Do they get into other, other parts of the body? And so far, the answer has been yes. They actually they get uh, everywhere. Obviously, the brain uh, may not be quite, uh, you know, it's well known that monoclonal antibodies often don't get to the brain as well as, as we would like. Right. OK, so with apologies. Um, you're our basic science representative at this meeting, so I'm going to shift away from your talk because there's some questions here about cure, mm -hmm. um, and one of them is role of CRISPR, and uh, do you have any opinion about that, uh, whether that's a way forward in trying to get to a cure strategy? Uh, I think it's, it's very early days, and it's going to have to be done very carefully, uh, uh, but, you know, I, I think that I would be surprised if in 10, 15 years uh, there weren't some CRISPR-related uh, technologies out there uh, that were being used. Targeting the latent reservoir. Yeah. And then <laughs> finally, do you or any colleagues, are you aware of folks using AI to help you in your development of vaccines and BNAPs? I, I, I don't know of anyone who isn't using AI <laughs> to help them <laughs> develop right. now. Very good. Thanks so much, Rick. Thank you. Thank you.